Good evening, everybody, and I want to welcome you tonight to this final Bible study experience of 2023. Can you believe we've made it to the end of another year? But God's been faithful and he's kept us and we are excited about what God has in store for 2024. And so tonight we're getting ready to get started in our time of sharing in the word and we're going to share the word of prayer as well. But first, can you do me a favor? If you haven't already done so, I want you to greet somebody right there in the virtual sanctuary. Tell them hello, good evening, let them know you're glad to see them. Maybe it's that person. Y'all chat all week long throughout, um, throughout the week about Bible study and New Psalmist and the Word and all. Go ahead and say good evening to them. And hit the share button as well. So if you're on our YouTube platform, hit the share button, send the link out, invite somebody else to meet you right now in Bible study. Maybe they haven't made it all year. They can make the last one of 2023 as we dive into uh, what, what carries over, what's on the cutting room floor from Sunday morning. So go ahead, hit that share button, send that link, send the text message, tell somebody to join you right now as we get ready to go deeper into the word and the message that we started on Sunday. Let's go to God in prayer together. Father and our God, we thank you right now for your presence and your power in our lives. We thank you that you are God and God alone. We thank you for this day that you've given us. We thank you for so, there's so many things we can say thank you for, but we just say thank you tonight. Now, God, our prayer is simple. Speak. Let us hear clearly from you. Speak tonight to somebody that their, your word may come alive for them personally, that they may hear something that helps them to grow closer to you, that strengthens and empowers them for your will, purpose, and plan for their lives. In Jesus' name, together we all say amen. Again, hit that share button, invite somebody to join you, as well as, and I want to say thank you first, but I want to also invite you to give tonight as well. Whenever we gather as a church, one of the things we do is we thank God through our giving and our generosity. And we want to invite you, even during our Bible study time, to be able to give uh, using Givelify, using PushPay, Fellowship One, um, what have you. There are different links even on our platforms you can use or go to our website, newpsalmist.org, and give your Bible study offerings even now, throughout the time together, or before we close out. But I want to thank you for what you're giving. It allows us to do ministry in the most excellent way. Uh, this past Sunday, we were able to commission um, our new sound system, our new audio system that allows us to enhance our worship experience and even utilize this worship space and this worship facility in ways that things are going to allow us to reimagine how we do some things and open our, our doors to some new opportunities. But I want to thank you and we want to thank you because you have helped to make this possible. Our, our audio team and our consultants did all of the, the designing and the engineering and all the tweaking and what have you, but you helped us to have the resource to make this happen. We even still have persons who are giving towards that effort and we want to say thank you so much for allowing us to make that possible. And another thing that your, your giving helps us to do is serve and bless others. You've seen in the holiday season how we bless families with meals and Christmas gifts and what have you. We just, I just can't say thank you enough for helping to make New Psalmist one of the greatest churches in the world. Because we are a great church, a great family, a fellowship, a, a body of Christ, we love to come together. And so Sunday morning we'll be together at nine o'clock but we're also going to be doing something special. We're still coming together on Christmas Eve. Yes, Christmas Eve, we have Sunday morning service at 9. But we're also coming together for our normal Christmas Eve service, but in the virtual format. It'll be at 8 o'clock on our YouTube platforms and our virtual platforms. We'll have a special cr virtual Christmas special. It'll air on Christmas Eve evening at 8 o'clock. It'll also air on Christmas Day, so you want to make sure you're subscribed and have the bell so you get notifications so you'll know what time is airing on Christmas Day. But on Christmas Day, we're also airing and rebroadcasting our Christmas concert. And I would encourage you and, and even challenge you when you have family and friends who are coming over, or maybe you're going somewhere else for Christmas Day, pull up the New Psalmist YouTube page. Maybe it's when the concert is live. Maybe it's putting up a replay, but share the sounds of the season. Because ultimately, even though we're getting gifts, toys, and eating good meals, Jesus is the reason for the season. So we'll be sharing in these Christmas experiences virtually. Again, Christmas Eve, 9 a.m. in person, 8 p.m. virtual on all of our platforms, our Christmas special, 
then Christmas Day, our Christmas special and our Christmas concert will be airing. You don't want to miss those. You want to share that with somebody that they might be blessed. Then we'll end the year together in worship. The last day of the year, December 31st. This year, it just so happens to also be on a Sunday. So at 9 a.m., I'll be preaching the word, preaching lessons learned in 2023. God has taught me a lot this year. And I know I have at least five or ten witnesses who can say amen in the virtual sanctuary that God has taught you some things as well. I'll, I'll put it to you this way. You'll, you'll get kind of a, a, a sneak preview of how I'm going to start the sermon. I began 2023 as Reverend Walter Scott Thomas, Jr., pastor of First Baptist Church of Stilton in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I'm ending this year as Dr. Walter Scott Thomas, Jr., pastor-elect of the New Psalmist Baptist Church in Baltimore, Maryland. There are a whole lot of lessons in just those two statements, and some of those I want to share with you in that worship experience. So I hope to see you here at 9 a.m. Then you get a chance to go home, refresh, throw your food in the oven so it's ready for you after our later service because our later service at 6 o'clock will be our New Year's Eve service, our traditional watch night service. Our bishop's going to be bringing the word, closing out 2023 in a way that only he can. We're going to worship God together, thanking him for the year that has been, looking forward to the year that is to come. So make sure you have it scheduled to be here two times on December 31st, 9 a.m. and then 6 p.m. for our end of year service. Maybe you're wondering how you're going to prepare your New Year's meal. That's fine. You can order from our catering ministry. Our food services department is making food available for you to order and purchase. They're going to have the black eyed peas and the collard greens, salmon cakes and crab cakes. So, so here's the website. I'm going to say it to you twice so you can get it. Um, I, I, we may have it in our chat box as well or maybe on the screen, but I want to make sure you get this address. The address to order food is watch dash night dash meals dot square dot site again that's watch dash night dash meals dot square dot site you can put those orders in leading all the way up to christmas eve the 24th and then pickup is going to be on the 31st right after nine o'clock morning service you'll pick up your food you can take it home you can put it on low and slow while you're doing worship or put it in after worship in case you don't want to have any issues at home but you'll have the food already prepared so you can go ahead and enjoy that New Year's Eve, New Year's Day celebration with family and friends. God is doing so much at New Psalmist, allowing us to do great things. Even more is in store for 2024. And so I want to go ahead and get into our lesson and our message tonight um, because I started this rather continued our sermon series on this past Sunday. Each week of Advent has a different theme. Each, each candle of the Advent wreath, maybe you've seen it before, it's the green wreath that has four candles around it. The first candle, again, is the candle of hope. The second candle is of peace. The third is of joy. And we're on the third Sunday of Advent, Joy Sunday. And so I share it from the thematic, the sermonic theme, rather, I still have joy, borrowing that title from that Dorothy Norwood song that many of us have heard sung many a time before coming from the prophetic word of Isaiah chapter 8. And the larger portion, rather chapter 8 and the chapter 9, the larger portion of chapter 8 starting at verse 19 down to chapter 9, verse 7. But for tonight, in the sake of time, I just want to read verse 6, which is really that portion that we lift up in the Christmas season as the prophecy that speaks of Jesus who is to come. It says in verse 6, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I started, I had a chance to start the message on Sunday and didn't get to finish all of it. And so I want to tonight share a little bit more of what I was planning um, to share on Sunday morning um, to really give us a full view of what this text is saying when we think about joy and the situations that we often find ourselves in that are not really joyful. The moments and periods of life where joy is the last thing on our mind, cracking a smile is the furthest thing we would think about. Because in the particular text that we're looking at, this prophecy from Isaiah, 
He's speaking to a people who are in times that are not joyful. He's speaking to a people who are about to go through an experience where the last thing on their mind is, is joy, peace, hope. They're going to be struggling to keep their head above water, struggling to survive, struggling to make it in the midst of a situation where attacks are coming against them and forces are mounting against them. Because I've shared with you in, in my two sermons in this message, both coming from Isaiah, that this is the prophet Isaiah, first Isaiah, if you will, who was speaking before the exile. So he's telling them about a period that is coming when there will be wars raged against them, where nations will rise against them, those nations being Israel and Syria coming against them, trying to overpower them. God will not let them prosper, but the Assyrians will come behind them because of the, uh, the un I don't want to call it unjust, I rather I'll say the uh, unsanctioned partnership, if you will, that they make with Assyria. Assyria then comes after them as well. As a matter of fact, if you look in 2 Kings, you'll begin to find the point in time when that really begins to happen for them. Isaiah is a prophet talking to them in the time that is happening in 2 Kings. It is when Ahaz is the king that they first enter the partnership with Assyria. But when Ahaz dies trying to champion Assyria to show up and help him, Ahaz dies. The one who comes after him is Hezekiah. Hezekiah goes in a different direction than Ahaz in that he begins to turn back to God. He begins to bring back the ways of their fathers and forefathers of worshiping God and serving God and, and praying to God and tearing down the, the idols and the structures of the false gods in such a way that God honors him. And so if you look at, I want you to write this down. Maybe you can turn to it in your Bible or your app if you have it. In 2 Kings chapter number 18, I want to read to you what happens with Hezekiah and Assyria because Assyria is an interesting group. They are a strong, mighty force, so strong that they can overtake the northern kingdom of Israel and overtake Syria as well. They defeat both of them, and then they turn their attention to Judah. So they are strong, they are powerful, but they're also smart in that their warfare is not always physical battles, but one of their strategies was also psychological warfare in that they would try to find ways to win battles without having to raise a fist. They, they would try to find a way to talk a nation into surrender. And that's what they try to do with Judah. So in chapter number, chapter number 18 of 2 Kings, verses 19 to 23, th this is what it says. The, <clears throat> excuse me, the Assyrians send someone, send uh, a commander to come and talk to Hezekiah's people. And he says, says, tell the field commander, to tell the field commander, said to them, tell Hezekiah, this is what the great king, the king of Assyria says. On what are you basing this confidence of yours? You say you have the counsel and the might for war, but you speak only empty words. On whom are you depending that you rebel against me? Look, I know you are depending on Egypt, that splintered reed of a staff, which pierces the hand of anyone who leans on it. Such is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who depend on him. But if you say to me, we are depending on the Lord our God, isn't he the one whose high places and altars Hezekiah removed? Saying to Judah and Jerusalem, you must worship before this altar in Jerusalem. So Assyria has sent a message to Judah saying, hey, listen, how dare y'all stand up against us? You all entered into an arrangement with us and now we are coming in overtaking you and you have nerve to say no. You, you, you have nerve to stand up against us. Who, how, how is it you have such confidence? Are you depending on Egypt? Okay, that makes some sense. But don't tell me you depended on God. Don't tell me you think God is going to do this for you. So he is trying to play some reverse psychology and get them to say, you know what? That's not going to work. Just go ahead and concede to us now. That's matter of fact, verse 23 is what it says in chapter 18 of 2 Kings, he says, come now, make a bargain with my master, the king of Assyria, 
I will give you 2,000 horses if you can put riders on them. Isn't that how the adversary sometimes works with us? He tries to negotiate us into conceding, into conforming into that which we know God has not planned or destined for our lives. He shows up, they show up, and this again is one of the ways in which they entered warfare, and it worked for them the majority of the time, that they could talk nations into defeat. They could talk nations into submission. And so they tried it with Judah, but it does not work. Hezekiah stands up against them, and God sees this. He sees Hezekiah's faithfulness. He sees that he's turning away from the, the recent history of leadership and is going back to the days of those who put their trust in God. And listen, when you put your trust in God, he will honor your faithfulness. He will honor your trust. He will honor your commitment to him. That, that there's a moment, and I, I mentioned it Sunday, but I want to read it tonight because we can dive a little bit deeper in our Bible study time. In chapter number 20 of 2 Kings, again, Assyria has come after them. Hezekiah has stood up to them, and God is honoring Hezekiah's faithfulness. In chapter 20, we read that Hezekiah becomes ill. He becomes sick, and the prophet comes to him to tell him that his time is is limited. Matter of fact, I, I, this is what it says, chapter 20. I'm going to read it to you from the book so you know that I'm not making it up. In those days, Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, again, this is Isaiah whose book we're reading. I know it comes later in the Old Testament, but this is the time period in which Isaiah is living. So the prophecies that he's speaking are to the people who we find in 2 Kings, at least the first part of Isaiah, which goes up, I believe, to chapter 44. That is first Isaiah. Second Isaiah begins to speak in a time period that is after the Babylonian exile. So Isaiah says to him, son of Amos, he went to him and said, this is what the Lord says, put your house in order because you're going to die. You will not recover. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. Remember, Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Verse four says, before Isaiah had left the middle of the court, the word of the Lord came to him. Go back and tell Hezekiah, the ruler of my people, this is what the Lord, the God of your father, David says, I have heard your prayer and have seen your tears. I will heal you. On the third day from now, you will go up to the temple. I will add 15 years to your life, and I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. There it is. I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. I will defend this city for my sake and for the sake of my servant David. See, because Hezekiah has turned back toward God when he prays, God hears his prayer. And sometimes you'll hear this categorized as God changing his mind. I take a different view and perspective of this particular moment, this particular scripture, in that I do not feel as though our prayers change God's mind. But I think when we pray, it makes us aware of God's ultimate plan and ultimate direction for us. It's not that it changed God's mind. I believe because Hezekiah prayed, he unlocked a door that was locked before. I believe because he prayed, the light was now turned on on a path that he did not know was available. It's not that God's mind has changed. It is that access is now made available because Hezekiah prayed and called on God and believed. I believe that faith opens doors. I believe that faith shines a light on a path that we would otherwise miss or a door we would otherwise not walk through if we were not operating in faith and trust in God. And, and, so, and so God keeps his people. He keeps his people from Assyria. But again, it doesn't end with Assyria because after Assyria, Babylon's coming and Babylon wears them out. 
and we read of the Babylonian ex exile and them being taken to other lands. In spite of all of that, that verse still remains that I read on Sunday, that verse still stands that when Isaiah begins talking about them coming back, he talks about them as those who have joy and their joy is now being increased and expanded. All of this going on in a time of war, persecution, exile, but when they come back, there's joy. And I lift that to you and I in this season because I want to highlight for us, confirm for some and introduce to others this reality. We control our reactions to and feelings towards adverse situations and seasons. So how it is we respond is up to us. How it is uh, how we feel towards something that is difficult and painful, it is up to us. Sometimes we give the situation too much power, thinking, oh, this is wearing me down. When the reality is we control how we will respond. Now, let me put this out there because I'm not some cold hearted individual who is out of touch with reality. There are some human reactions that just happen. They are inevitable. That there are some moments where you will be overcome with the opposite of joy. Pain, grief, sorrow, sadness, that is human nature. And yes, we are human beings. But I share with you a line that one of my middle school teachers shared with our class, and I have held on to this every day and every season of my life. You'll hear me say it more than once in my tenure here at New Psalmist. But this is what the reality is. Pain is inevitable. Misery is an option. Yes, we're going to have pain. We're going to hurt. We're going to have moments, days, seasons where we are hurting. But misery is the option. Am I going to stay here or am I going to move on? Am I going to allow this to be my new reality, to be miserable, to be down, to be out? Or am I going to make up in my mind, this is not going to hold me. This is not going to be the end. This will not be my lot. And so how is it I can have joy in these difficult moments? I choose it. Somebody in the virtual sanctuary, can you help me and just type, I choose joy? I choose to be joyful. I choose to be happy. I choose to be upbeat. I choose to have a smile on my face. I choose not to let everything going on around me dwell within me still have joy and the text in Isaiah lifts up what I shared Sunday that I have joy because the God whom I we serve is the God of the turnaround that God turns things around for you and I he has been doing it and he continues to do it today that God can turn a situation that the, the scripture talks about turning my morning into dancing we've seen that in our lives how God can turn things around and we can go from crying our eyes from sorrow to crying tears of joy for what the Lord has done. Because joy, my brothers and sisters, is it is I, 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 for me, when I talk about joy, it is a state of contentment. So, so I don't mean when I say I still have joy in these situations that I'm skipping everywhere and I'm singing zippity doo dah zippity a 24-7. It is not some false sense of reality. It is not as if I have taken some, some spiritual quick fix pill and I'm on some uh, high, if you will, that this is not sustainable. No, joy is really contentment in chaos. It, it is contentment in crisis. It is contentment in calamity. It is learning the words of the scripture that Paul writes in Philippians chapter 4 are true. For I have learned to be content in whatever the circumstance. He goes on to say, I've known what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now that part, sorry, I said the King James, that's how I learned it. But the truth is, that is our contentment, that our strength comes from Christ. Our, our contentment is knowing that when it's all said and done, God has the final say. And so this takes spiritual growth and maturity to be able to hold fast to that when the storm is raging. 
when the winds are blowing and, and, and the dark clouds are over you and all you can see is barely anything, that's the moment where your spiritual growth and maturity kicks in. And you say, I still have joy. I will be content in the middle of this hurricane. I, I'll be content in the middle of this flood. I'll be content in the middle of this fire. And that contentment comes from knowing this. God's got it. And whatever that looks like, I'm trusting and believing it is God's will and God's plan. Can, I, I want to challenge us to seek that as our reality. Because what it does for you, it allows you not to be pulled by the ebbs and the flows of life that are inevitably coming. But what it also does for others is it gives them a glimpse of the God whom you serve. And I want to challenge you and suggest to you that the way in which you handle crisis and circumstance and calamity can be the very tool that leads somebody else to Jesus Christ and that helps them to grow deeper in their spiritual journey and their spiritual walk with God. And so I talk about having joy because we serve the God of the turnaround. But we also can have joy in these difficult situations and have peace in the midst of the storm because we serve a God. This is the way God gave it to me. We serve the God who turns the lights on, turns the lights on for us. In verse number two, and I'm back in Isaiah now, in verse number two of the text from Sunday, in chapter nine, verse number two, Isaiah writes this prophetic word. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Now, when the prophet Isaiah speaks these prophecies, and this is the case with, with quite a few of the prophets we find in the Old Testament, or whenever a prophetic word is given, it, it is spoken in, and here it is written in what is known as the prophetic perfect, in that the prophet is speaking as if, Isaiah is speaking as if, what he's talking about has already happened, even though it has not yet come to pass. He's speaking about a future tense and a present tense. Verse two, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. He's speaking as, as if this is and has happened. This is what some scholars call again, the prophetic perfect. He's, what he's talking about is going to happen in the future. He's speaking about it as if it is going on now and has been taking place. Look, walking in darkness, people walking in darkness, if they're walking in it now, they have seen a great light. He's talking like it's already happened. Those living in the land of the deep, of, of a deep darkness, a light has dawned as if light has already dawned on them. But he's talking about things that are going to happen, not just after the exile, but in the grander scheme of things. He's talking about a moment that we see in the New Testament when Jesus is born. He's speaking of a future time as if it has already come to pass because the light comes to the shepherds. The light comes to the shepherds in Luke's gospel and recording of Jesus being born. For the angel shows up and says, do not be afraid, for see, I'm bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. That is the ultimate light because Jesus is the light of the world. That is the light that comes into a dark world. But Isaiah writes in such a way that he's talking as if it has already happened. And while that is, again, the prophetic perfect, the reality is whatever God speaks something, it has already happened. Whenever you receive a word from God, an utterance from the Lord, whether God speaks to you directly or uses his vessel to bring a word, it has already happened. I need you to help me tonight in, in teaching and help me to emphasize this and just I guess that's when the virtual sanctuary, you're typing it. But if we were physical, I would say tap your neighbor, but just type to your neighbor and tell him it's already done. It's already accomplished. 
is already fulfilled. Isaiah can speak in such a manner because he's speaking on behalf of the eternal God. And he's speaking with a confidence and knowing that if God gave me this word, it shall come to pass so I can talk like it's already done. Whatever God has spoken into you, you can believe it, claim it, and speak as if it's already done, as long as it was God. As long as it's God speaking to you and not you making up a word for yourself. I'm not talking about self-fulfilling prophecies. I'm talking about a word that has come from the Lord, direction that has come from the Lord, a word from the Lord, the Most High. Those words we can speak with clarity and confidence because the word of God shall not return void. It shall come to pass. So Isaiah speaks as if it is something that's already happened, but he's pointing us forward again for those he's speaking to. He's pointing them to the time when the exile shall end. But for those of us who are outside of the moment, he's giving a glimpse of the Messiah who is to come, who Jesus, who is to come, who shall be born. Just to give you a little bit of how it ties into what we're doing today. The third week of Advent, I told you, is the week of joy. That candle that is lit not only symbolizes joy, but it is also called the shepherd's candle. So this is the week in which the joy that abounds in those shepherds who are by the field, who are overlooked by society, but God shined a bright light on them. And the joy they had in that moment is the joy we have today. I shared a little bit of this on our prayer call last night. Let me not gloss over it too fast. The shepherds were the people who would have been living in darkness in that people disregarded them, didn't think much of them. They were not seen as anything high in society because they hung out and smelled like sheep. But yet when God sent his son to the world, he shined a light on the lowly shepherds because the light of the world had come. Those who were living in darkness, a bright light has dawned. We serve a God who turns on the light. In our darkest situations, God will turn the light on. When people have turned on us, God will turn the light on. When we've been forgotten, God will turn the light on. I, I remember uh, back in the days when you saw this was at 4501 and a half Old Frederick Road when Bishop would preach on Sundays. There was one member in the church, one gentleman who was a part of our church family at that time, and it would get good during the sermon. And he would say, turn the light on, Doc, turn the light on, Doc, because for him, a light was turning on as the word was being spoken. God will turn a light on not just around you, but within you. That light of a fresh revelation of what he's speaking, a fresh revelation of who you've been called and purposed to be. God turns a light on, not just around us, but within us. That's why Jesus says, we're not only the salt of the earth, we are the light of the world, because there's a light within the believer. There's a light within you and I. So the only way darkness can reign, if I had a little more time, I'd dive in this a little bit further. The only way darkness can reign is if we decide to turn our lights out. And I'm challenging you in this season, don't turn your light out. Don't you flip that switch. You keep the light on because God has turned it on within you. That, 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 that's why I, I can declare, I can, I can pronounce, I still have joy because God has turned the light on and is still shining light. And when darkness thinks it has overwhelmed me, it does not know I've got my own night light. I've got an internal nightlight. So even if I'm surrounded by the darkness and the craziness and the madness of this insane world, light still shining from within. Do not turn your light out. Let your light continue to shine because we serve the God who turns the light on. Here's the last thing that I want to share with you that wasn't able to be shared. It, it got cut on Sunday morning. So I got to share it with you now. Our time is just about at an end for our Bible studies for 2023. I still have joy because of God of the turnaround. That's who we serve. We serve the God who turns things around. We serve the God who turns the light on. But we also serve the God 
who takes his time, who takes his time. Talk to you about this, this prophetic perfect that Isaiah is speaking in. He's talking to a people who haven't even gone into exile yet about a period, again, not just after the exile, but pointing all the way down to the birth and the coming of Jesus Christ. This is not an overnight quick fix for what they're about to go through on the text. And often in society, we look for the quick fix. We want things quick, fast, and hairy, especially today. When, when I've got this wonderful device of a smartphone and I have everything I could want and need at my fingertips, I mean, I've, I've got a cell phone, I've got a computer, I've got a calculator, I, I've got an encyclopedia, I've got a database, I've got a, a, an executive assistant right all in the palm of my hand. Anything I could need, it's right here. But sometimes God says, no, you got to wait for some things. Not because I'm being cruel, but because it's not yet my time. See, there is something different between our time and God's time. I, I know I've got Bible scholars tonight, so you know about Kronos and Kairos time. Kronos time being our time, the, the hours and the minutes, the days and the weeks, the, the ticking of the clock. That's why some, some watches are called chronographs. Kronos, that is our time. Kairos is God's timing. God's timing, meaning one, God is not confined to time and space. That's how it is when God speaks it, it's already done because God is eternal. And so today is also tomorrow in God's timing. But God's timing, it goes back to that old church statement. He may not come when you want him, but he's always on time because God's timing is never off. His watch is never slow. His clock is never broken. God's timing is always right. And the reason why you and I can have joy in any situation is because God takes his time. God's time considers all variables. It's most importantly the ones that we are not aware of. So when Isaiah writes, for, to us a child is born, to us a son is given, it's not something that's just going to happen tomorrow. It's going to happen on God's timing. It's not something happening next week. It's going to happen in God's timing. But they can still have joy because God's given them some word, this word, and if God has given a word, it shall come to pass. For you and I, we know who Isaiah is speaking of. But in the moment, they are not fully sure, fully aware. And so to hold on to that, again, it goes back to having that faith and that trust in God in the middle of all the craziness, all the hustle and bustle, all the calamity, all of the crisis that they go through. And I want to challenge you and I, my brothers and sisters, we, we may not be in the midst of an exile. We may not be having nations warring against us, even though there are wars in the land. But whatever it is that's going on in and around you, hold on to God's hand. Trust and believe his word. Know that he is in control and that he is still in charge and that that light is not going out. He is shining a light and he's taking his time. For unto you, a child is born, a savior is given. Again, we know who that speaks of. We, we know the one who is to come. And even when he comes, it's going to be 30 years after his arrival before he stands up as teacher, stands up as defender of the faith, if you will, stands up as one who questions the Pharisees and speaks truth to power, stands up before religious leaders and government leaders and declares, I am. It's going to be 30 years even after he's born for that and 33 before he makes the sacrifice for you and I. But it takes time. I'm going to close with this. Sunday, I was setting up Reverend Al, an illustration to show this next point. I told Reverend Al I had some boxes that were going to be delivered because we've been doing this thing throughout this series. And so at different points in the sermon, he was grabbing a box and putting it on the flatbed behind me. You may have seen him a couple of times. If you weren't there, go to the YouTube channel, watch the message. You understand what I'm talking about tonight. So he's getting the boxes ready because there was going to come a point where I would take it and turn it around and you would see what the boxes were all about. 
it was to highlight this. Throughout the message, different boxes were coming, different packages were coming, being delivered at the, at the uh, correct address, at your door front. They were being delivered, but they were taking their time. It wasn't all coming at once. It was taking time for everything to get there. And it was to highlight this point, and I hope somebody gets this, to highlight the point of this, that sometimes we got to wait on what God is bringing us. We got to be willing to dance through the delays, understanding that it's still coming. The other week, my, my kids and I, we ordered pizza. It said one time on the app, it came about 30 minutes later. I was a little upset, but the pizza was still good. and We still ate, we were still nourished, still got there on time. But here's the greater point and what I wanted to demonstrate and illustrate with Reverend Al and I with the, with the illustration, it was this, something that I've learned this year and I've learned rather in life is that it takes time for larger orders to be filled. And sometimes you and I are waiting on God because he's not bringing us just one small little package. He's bringing us something that takes time to fill the order. It takes time to bring all the pieces together. It takes time to get everything in place so that when you receive it, when you receive your delivery, there is no delay in you going forth and using it. There is no delay in it coming to pass. It took time for you to get it, but now that you got it, you can go forth with it as God sees fit. Because what God is sending to you and I, it is of a magnitude, not the quantity, but the quality of it, that you can say this isn't from anybody but God. The reason why I say that with this particular text is that when Isaiah says, for unto us a child is born, a son is given, he says, and he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father. He says he shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Now, now this one is kind of a two for one. If you got the King James and New King James, you'll see a comma between Wonderful and Counselor because some editors and their early translations saw this as two different things, which God is, which Jesus is. He is wonderful, and he's also a counselor. The two do stand on their own as characterizations of who he is. But in the proper understanding of the way in which the Hebrew is written, in that each clause has multiple pieces, it is better understood that he is a wonderful counselor, in that he is a wonder of a counselor that his wisdom exceeds that even of Solomon, the wisest human being to ever live, that his wise counsel is above compare. He is a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, that he is God, that he is a mighty God, a strong God. And when it uses God here, it uses El, not Elohim. Elohim is sometimes used in the Hebrew Speaking of various gods, when it's El, it's speaking of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Yahweh, the one true living God. He's saying this is not just a God, this is God. This isn't something like, no, this speaks of him as a part of the Godhead. For thus we have a Trinitarian understanding. The Son, Jesus, the one who's coming, the Jesus, the Son of God. So it says he's a mighty God, Prince of Peace. He will be royalty. And he shall bring peace. Everlasting father. So speaking of relationship, but also that he, sh he shall be eternal forever and ever more. That's a whole lot coming. It's taking some time to get that order together. And so what God is sending, if you got to wait, it's, 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 not, it's not a penalty. It's not you don't, no, 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 it's not because you messed up. No, it's because it's taking time to get the order prepared to get the order together. It's a lot coming your way. So I still got joy. And, and I hope in this season, because it can be hard for some. I know this year may have been difficult for some. But I pray that when the clock strikes 12 and we go from 2023 to 2024, that you still have joy. And that 2024 might, as the scripture says, that it might increase your joy. I do pray you gleaned and learned something tonight 
I, I do pray that something was said and shared that made some light come on in you. We're getting ready to go. We're getting ready to leave. We're getting ready to depart. I want to thank you again and invite you again to give even now. Do psalmist again. We've called to do so much. We've doing it and we've been doing it well. And we'll continue to do it because God has sent those who are faithful in their stewardship and their generosity. So even now you can give on Givelify. Look for new psalmists in Baltimore. Push pay. You, you know, you can give there. Fellowship one. You can give there. Or maybe Sunday morning you want to add it to your envelope. Bible study gift. You can give that as well. We thank you for your offerings. We thank you for your gifts. We thank you for how you support the vision and the mission of our church. 2023 doesn't have many days left. It's more behind it than it is before. But as we go forth into this next year, we go forth with joy and inner contentment no matter what's going on. 2024 is going to be a unique year. I don't speak this as a prophetic word. I'm looking at the signs of the times. The Bible said the sons of Iskar had to know the sign, discern the signs of the times. The signs of the times is next year is going to be an interesting and unique time. No matter what we face, though, don't let it take your joy. You still got it. And I close with these good old church words. This joy that we have, the world didn't give it. And the world can't take it away. God, we thank you for our time together to share tonight and throughout this year, our time of sharing and growing in your word. God, I pray right now that what you have spoken, let it come alive in your people. Let our joy increase. Let our light, our illumination, our spiritual brilliance go forth and shine in such a way that the darkness of this world cannot stand the light of Christ that comes from within. God, I thank you now for giving us opportunity to be a blessing to you in our giving. Bless the gifts that are given tonight. Bless the word shared tonight. Bless every individual who has shared live or on replay and let them see your hand at work. Because God, no matter what comes our way, we declare we still have joy. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. I'll see you Sunday morning as we worship God together on Christmas Eve.